Heads up, you are in the Hoodwood. I'm the Black Bandit KJ Green, welcoming you to Sports from the Hoodwood for February 8th, 2019. Coming up this week are the Pats and NFL Dynasty after winning a defensive grinder in the big game. The NBA trade deadline, who moves and will it shift power? Is it inevitable that Bryce Harper ends up in the Bronx? The Hoodwood College Hot 5 has more fresh takes and a top 10 shakeup. All that mixed together with fat gap, head slap, and a good heaping of info and opinion in this edition of Sports from the Hoodwood. That's your seatbelt, and let's go. You're tuned in to Sports from the Hoodwood, the internet's foremost location for the most honest, unfiltered commentary and insight on the world of sports. Now, once again, here's Hoodwood's hometown hero, KJ Green. Greetings from the Hoodwood, where the flags are at half staff for the loss of a Hoodwood legend. Rest in peace to Frank Robinson. He passed away Thursday after a brave fight with bone cancer. He was 83. I'll have. A final word from the wood coming up on Robbie later. But let's start with the NFL season, which is over, finally. The Patriots are once again on top of the pro football world after their 13-3 defensive slugfest over the L.A. Rams last Sunday in Atlanta. Julian Edelman was named the MVP, and I... Don't really have a problem with his performance. 10 catches for 141 yards. But I really think if you got popped for pads, you shouldn't be eligible to play in the postseason. But that's just my opinion on it. But he was named MVP and the Patriots, counted out by many pundits, yours truly included, after the divisional round and the AFC Championship. But I did pick them to win the Super Bowl, and they did. Like I told you in the preview last week, if you give Bill Belichick two weeks to prepare for a game and to prepare a game plan, he will destroy you. It was sad to see young Sean McVay have no answers to give his equally young quarterback, Jared Goff, for the the exotic schemes that the Pats brought to bear. The Rams never got into the red zone for the entire game at all they seemed like they were punting every time they had the ball and their one shot at the end zone was too high for brandon cooks and another foray downfield was thwarted with an interception inside the 10 the rams offense was neutered and todd Gurley was again m-i-a and i feel bad for a rams defense that played an extraordinary game I mean, come on, let's be honest. If you held the Patriots, if you said to somebody, you're holding the Patriots to 13 points, most teams would take their chances with winning the game. They would think, oh, we've got a good shot. We held oh, Tom Brady to 13 points. We can win the game. But the Patriots defense came up aces. Whereas the Rams defense come up with a full house. Seems like the Patriots had a straight flush. And the Rams offense did nothing against the Pats. They tied a Super Bowl record for fewest points scored. I mean, it was fewest points scored in a Super Bowl game, period, at only 16 points, bettering the, or I should say worsening, <laughs> I don't know if it's better, better or worse, the 14-7 defensive struggle the Dolphins had over the Redskins in Super Bowl seven that was 46 years ago. But it just seemed the Rams' offense was running in place, if not running in molasses. And I wonder why McVay didn't vary out his running game. Why he just didn't flare Anderson and Gurley out for passes. Why he continued to doggedly run Gurley and sometimes Anderson straight into the pat the teeth of the Pats defense. And without a credible running game, Goff could not set up a play action. And being a pocket passer, Goff was very, very ordinary, if not 
fairly bad. The Rams' offense was predicated on getting their running game going and keeping a Pats defense honest instead of being able to pin their ears back and just bull rush golf. Now, the Rams, for their part, they really didn't beat Brady up, as I like to say they should have. I mean, they kept the Patriots' offense, who could score and score with the best of them, in check. I mean, the Patriots scored 41 in the divisional round, 37 in the AFC title game. They scored 13 in the Super Bowl. But it was enough. The Rams' offense did not show up. And because they didn't, they left a tired Rams' defense left gasping for air in the fourth quarter when the Patriots finally put together the one foray into the red zone, the entire game, by both teams. Sony Michelle crashing over from a yard out to give the Patriots what more or less looked like an insurmountable lead because the Rams' offense was not moving. And finally, after the game was over and everyone was wondering, what happened to the Rams' offense? No one still had an answer for why Ty Gurley was so ineffective. Sean McVay wasn't saying anything. Ty Gurley wasn't saying anything. And the Rams came up short in Super Bowl 53. We'll take a look at the NBA trading deadlines or non-deals in a bit. But first, let's speculate where I think that free agent slugger Bryce Harper should go. Now, I've spoken at length about Bryce Harper and and to a lesser extent, Manny Machado on where or why MLB teams have not signed either one of the sluggers to long term deals. Now, though, there are rumors that Harper will now go to San Francisco and play for the Giants, a move that makes as much sense as him going to San Diego, which I talked about last week as well. The place I think Bryce Harper should go is the New York Yankees. Now, I'm not a Yankees fan by any stretch of the imagination, but if the Yankees do not want a repeat of the 2018 season in which the Red Sox ran away and hid with the AL East on their inexorable march to winning the World Series last fall and their World Series combatants, the Dodgers, seemingly uninterested in pairing the game's best pitcher with the best game's best young hitter. The Yankees need to jump on this. Think about this. A lineup that has Aaron Judge, Bryce Harper, and John Carlos Stanton back to back to back. You thought Judge and Stanton were, were a handful. How are you going to pitch around a lefty, righty, lefty, combo of Judge, Harper, and Stanton. Find me an out. You make a mistake to either one or any of those three hitters. You're staring at a souvenir over the outfield fence. But the Yankees keep saying they don't want to overspend. Come on. These are the Yankees we're talking about. The Yankees have a license to print money with the Yes Network. They are in the biggest media market. They have the money. Now, getting a lineup with Bryce Harper in it would give the Yankees the power to parry the Boston Red Sox. I mean, the Sox aren't going to win 108 games again. But this team, the Red Sox, are not going to fade, and they're not going to shirk against the Yankees. I mean, you think about it. The Yankees used to use their dominance over the Red Sox to be in their head. I mean, they could look at the the Red Sox and say, I'm in here, I'm in here, pointing at the head. But after the Red Sox came back from 3-0 down to win the ALCS in 2004 and have subsequently won four World Series, count it, one, two, three, four. Since 2004, to the Yankees won, the only time they've been to the World Series, since they blew that 3-0 lead to the Red Sox in 2004, they've only been to the World Series once. 
The Red Sox have been to the World Series four times and have won all four times. The Red Sox aren't afraid of the Yankees anymore like they used to be. And unless the Yankees can curb their rampage and dominance, the Yankees might be the third best team in the AL behind the Red Sox and the Astros. Two teams that played a classic ALCS last fall. If the Yankees don't want to fall even further behind in this in this uh, arms race, they need to get another big name slugger. They need to get Bryce Harper. As much as being a, a Twins fan, it pains me to say it, it. It's the Yankees, and the Yankees can afford another big name, big money player. They are the Yankees. We will take our first time out of the day and come back with the NBA trade deadline has come and gone. And there have been a lot of big names that changed teams, but one team did not acquire the big name that they thought that they were going to get. And has it really destroyed their emotional stability? We'll get into that and a whole bunch of other things as Sports from the Hoodwood rolls on after this. You're tuned into Sports from the Hoodwood, the Internet's foremost location for no-nonsense commentary, insight, and opinions on the world of sports. Here now live in living color, Black by popular demand. Your host, KJ Green. You're back in the Hoodwood. I am KJ Green. And the NBA trading deadline has come and gone on Thursday. And while there were some big moves ahead of the deadline, notably uh, Christoph Porzingis getting traded to the Mavs, uh, Nicola Murchik got dealt to the Bucks, Stein Maker sent to the Pistons, and, and Tobias Harris going to the Sixers. Uh, Mark Gasol going to the Raptors was an interesting move, but who didn't get moved was the biggest name. That was Anthony Davis. After all the talk about he wanted to be traded ahead of the trading deadline, he didn't go anywhere. And you have to wonder how the Pelicans will handle their recalcitrant star, and more notably, how bad the emotionally fragile Lakers will be going forward. Now, this is a team, the Lakers, who are swinging wildly from one emotion to the other. Tuesday night, they were in Indianapolis playing the Pacers, and they got poleaxed. And I'm saying that in the kindest terms, they lost by 42 points. The worst loss than any LeBron James team has ever suffered in his career. Where he's been on the court and playing, his team took such a horrid loss. They got absolutely destroyed. But then turned right around on Thursday night in Boston against an equally good, if not better, Celtics team stand toe-to-toe with one of the top teams in the East on their turf and steal a 129-128 win with Rajon Rondo hitting a floater at the buzzer. Cut that out. But it's one of those things where the Lakers, after all that was going on, after all the speculation that was going to go on with who was going to get traded by the Lakers to the Pelicans to get Anthony Davis, was it going to be Kentavious Caldwell Polk? Was it going to be Brandon Ingram? Was it going to be JaVale McGee? Was it going to be... Uh, Alonzo Ball, a number of these young Lakers had to endure the taunts 
by the Pacers faithful who just were brutal taunting them saying you're getting traded or you're not worthy or LeBron doesn't want you it was I don't want to say sad it's kind of funny you were expecting the Lakers to get clobbered by the Celtics just as bad as they got clobbered by the Pacers. But they showed some resiliency. Now, going forward, with all the rumors that have been going about and who was getting traded and who wasn't, the Lakers made a couple of small moves. Acquiring uh, Mike Muscala from the Clippers, who had just gotten traded from the Sixers in the Tobias Harris deal. But, the Lakers themselves are an emotionally fragile franchise and they are not in the playoff chase right now. And the thing is this, LeBron James is trying to make moves behind the scenes, trying to create another super team like he had Miami. But the team he has in Los Angeles is not a playoff worthy team. And Lonzo Ball, despite what his ignorant daddy has said, and I'll get to that later, talked a lot of talk. The Lakers are not a good team. I like Luke Walton. I think he's a decent coach. But I think he's in over his head. I think it's a mess that he really didn't need to be a part of. The Lakers are bad. Not bad like the Bulls or the Cavaliers, but in the West, where men are men, and 50 wins might get you a set, 50 wins of coconut smile might get you a seven seed. The Lakers aren't going to win 50 games. The Lakers will be lucky to win 45 games. And playoffs, playoffs. You want to break out the Jim Mora sounder then. Don't talk to the Lakers about playoffs. They're going to be lucky to win a game. And when I say a game, they'll win a few here and there. But with the Lakers win tonight, they just break over 500. 28 and 27. Still haven't hit the All-Star game yet. But if you think about it, the Lakers would have to break out a 22-8 and eight run down the stretch to hit 50 wins. And they're not going to do that. They still have the Sacramento Kings in front of them to even get close to the 8th spot, which is currently held by the Los Angeles Clippers. The trading deadline did improve some teams. I think with Gasol going to the Raptors, they're all in. They're trying to win a title or at least get to the finals this year with Kawhi Leonard and Kyle Lowry. They have the good enough team to do that and at present are game and a half behind the rampaging Bucks for the top seed in the Eastern Conference. We're still a long way from, from getting there. The Bucks, of course, uh, acquiring Nikola Murotic, and that strengthens their team considerably. Giannis Antetokounmpo is going to be on the very short list for, for MVP this year. Now, the Sixers getting Tobias Harris, who's having a career year, makes that team stronger. But they, right now, sit in the, fo- in the five slot in the East. I can't see another good Boston uh, Sixers first round series. That would be great to watch. But that team is going to be a force to deal with coming down the stretch. 
We will take another time out real quick and come back with the Hoodwood Hot 5 as well as Fat Dab Head Slap as Sports from the Hoodwood continues after this. You're tuned in to Sports from the Hoodwood, the Internet's premier location for no-nonsense commentary, insight, and opinion on the world of sports. Here now, the man with 100% certified fresh taste, your host, KJ Green. We are back in the Hoodwood. I'm KJ Green. And let's hit the Hoodwood Hot Five. The Oops version as we've come to know it. The first topic I have this week in the Hot Five is what is wrong with the Pacific 12 Conference? Is the Pac-12 that bad? I'm hearing talk that the Pac-12 will only get one bid. Has the Pac-12 fallen that far where there they may be a one-bid conference? I mean, I'm looking at some of these teams. I mean, UCLA fell apart. They weren't that good to begin with. They got absolutely drilled by my Bearcats uh, in December. Washington at 19 and 4 might be the best team in the conference. And that's not saying much. They're unbeaten in the conference having beaten Arizona at the McHale Center on Thursday night. And they're 10 and 0. And then you have a fall off so steep. Oregon State is 6 and 3 in the conference. Then you have Arizona State, USC, and Utah all tied at six and four. Arizona, Oregon, UCLA at five and five. You talk about just everybody cannibalizing one another. This isn't like the Big Twelve. I'm mean, not beg your pardon, the Big Ten. That is a t- rough and tough conference. But the Big Ten, while has a solid morass of teams, Michigan, Purdue, Wisconsin, Michigan State. Maryland and Iowa all ranked. All of those aforementioned teams have at least 16 wins. Purdue has 16 wins, but they're 9-2 and two in conference. Iowa 7-5 and five in conference, but they're 18-5 and five overall. And Michigan, of course, leads the conference at 20 at 21-2 and two overall, 10-2 and two in conference. That's an exception. That's a cannibalization of a conference. But the, that conference is strong. The Pac-12 has Washington, who is decent, and a whole bunch of mediocre chaff. The Pac-12 may only get, or should I say only deserves, one bid. But you know they'll get four. Because the power conferences have to have their certain number of teams, which disgusts me. Zion Williamson gets the highlights. John Morant from Murray State is a little man doing big things. Keep your eye on since he's Jared and Cumberland. He had another great game for the Bearcats on Thursday night against Memphis as they've ran their winning streak to eight and are ranked. That's going to be a really good game on Sunday, Houston and Cincinnati. You can check your local listings for the time. In your area, but I'm telling you, American has some has some pretty deep sleeper teams in it. And, and speaking of sleeper teams, why are teams like Buffalo, Old Dominion, the aforementioned Murray State, and San Francisco reduced to win it to get in its status, while garbage teams like Indiana, Oklahoma, Arizona? They'll get free passes to play like shit and not worry about their tourney status. Why are my beloved Bearcats just now cracking the top 25? They have 20 wins. They're 20 and 3. But they're just barely getting any love. I had said it before and I'll say it again. I think that Penny Hardaway is one of the most overrated, overhyped coaches. In the country. Yeah he was a dominant. High school team for Memphis East. 
taking over for an ill friend that eventually passed away and building that team into a Tennessee State power. And now he's coaching his alma mater, University of Memphis. And many people think he's going to be a dominant coach. He has a lot of NBA assistant coaches helping him. But I think that Penny Hardaway is not going to be a good college coach. I just don't. Let's break into the Hoodwood Top 10. Looks as follows from 10 to 1. Number 10 is Houston, who last week was not ranked. Number 9, Virginia Tech. Returning to the Top 10 is Michigan. They also were not ranked last week, but I have them returning to the Top 10. At number 7, moving up from 8 is UNC. Moving up to 6 from 7 is Nevada. Moving up from 6 to 5 is University of Kentucky. And then the top 4 remains the same. Gonzaga at 4, Duke at 3, Virginia at 2, and number 1 is the one-loss Tennessee Volunteers. Now, Virginia and Duke square up on Saturday in Charlottesville. Duke responsible for Virginia's lone loss of the season. That should be a good matchup no matter what your conference affiliation or inclination is. I think that will be a good matchup. In the top 10, also dropping out from last week, Marquette was last week number 9. Kansas last week was number 10. And Michigan State drops out. From number five. Now, Marquette and Michigan State are out after shameful home losses to middling teams. Marquette losing to St. John's? Eh, I don't know. They lost to St. John's when they played them in in, uh, in NYC last month. But losing to them at home is kind of inexcusable. I mean, St. John's is... St. John's aren't world beaters. I mean, they'll never crack the Hoodwood top 10 anytime this season. They are decent, but you have to defend your home court. Michigan State lost to Indiana on Saturday. They had college game day there. And the fans just took that win for Michigan State over Indiana for granted. An Indiana team that lost seven straight and currently are on the bottom third of the Big Ten at four and eight. Now the Jayhawks were on the fringe. They were on in the top ten. And they they not to say that a loss to in state rival K State was a bad thing. And it's far from shameful, but they cannot the Jayhawks have shown that they cannot win outside of Allen Fieldhouse. And that's gonna be a problem. That's gonna end up being a real problem if they are losing true road games, the Jayhawks cannot stay in the hood with top 10. They're going to have to prove to me that they can win on the road to get back in to the hood with top 10. Now, there are some people who used to take my speculation sheet, which is a kind of variation of bubble watch. I have decided not to write that this year for reasons that I've been extremely busy. And that is a lot of work that I've had to do to maintain that over the last, I've been writing the speculation sheet for about 15 years now. But I think it's time to hang that one up, at least for this season. I may bring it back next year, depending on how things go. But right now, we're just going to do the Hoodwood Top 10 and maybe speculate a couple of times on who I think should get into the, to the, uh, to the tournament. But we'll do that at another time. We will take a timeout. Our final timeout of the day, come back with Fat Dap, Head Slap, and the final word from the wood. And Sports from the Hood, Wood heads down the home stretch after this. You're tuned into Sports from the Hood, Wood. The Internet's foremost location for the most honest insight and opinion on the world of sports. Now, once again, here's the man of the hour after hours. Your host, KJ Green. Rounding third and headed home here in the Hoodwood. We will wrap up the week as usual with...
with our Fat Dap Hit Slap and final word from the wood. From Fat Dap, I say very briefly to my beloved Cincinnati Bearcats, who finally cracked the top 25 after I campaigned for them for so long. Ahead of a massive showdown with the Houston Cougars on Sunday, they did beat the Memphis Tigers 69-64 to run their streak to eight in a row and also eight straight seasons of 20 wins or better. Fat dap to my beloved Bearcats who are still winning despite all the haters that continue to throw shade at them. Now, the head slap of the week goes to the grinning, jeering buffoon that is LeVar Ball, who opined on FS1 skipping Shannon uh, on Thursday morning that his son Lonzo was a better player than LeBron. Now, hearing him say that, you wonder if he says ignorant shit like this for shock value. Because sometimes he says it and has this look on his face like, yeah, I said it. So what? I may not believe it, but it got you to pay attention. And a lot of times I think he says things for shock value to see if you're paying attention or to draw attention. Saying that Lonzo Ball, who is at best a fairly passable starting player for the Lakers in his second year, is better than LeBron James, is laughable on the surface. Lonzo Ball at his best is not anywhere close to LeBron James at his worst, at 34. Now, I'm not going to say LeBron James is this otherworldly player and this, this and that. I mean, the argument can go back and forth one way or the other. I have a problem with LeBron James having a seemingly shirking away from taking big shots. As we talked about earlier, the Lakers beating the Celtics when Rajon Rondo won it with a buzzer beater. LeBron James was 15 feet away with a scramble for the ball. He was nowhere near the ball. Rondo got the ball tapped to him. He made the last shot. Lonzo Ball wasn't even on the court. Lonzo Ball was on the sidelines. If Lonzo Ball was better than LeBron James, would he be taking that final shot? Or in the final scrum to take the final shot? LeVar Ball is a fool. I don't think much of Lonzo to begin with, and I think that the elder LeVar has talked his son into onto the Lake Show and into a situation that he can't control. But LeVar now thinks his boy would be better to suit in Wait for it now. Phoenix. Now, the parade ball has been shooting off his mouth for the better part of three years now. Why do people entertain this clown? After openly insulting Lakers coach Luke Walton on Thursday morning and campaigning for Brian Shaw to be the Lakers coach. Ball then said the Phillies ball was a better player than LeBron. Which I start, still think is foolish and stupid. I hope Ball gets shipped to a pro Siberia like Orlando or Memphis or New York. Not Brooklyn, but New York. Where he would wither and fade. Though I think that the elder Ball would act a fool in the NYC media market. And be a, a page six legend. Sort of in the manner like George Steinbrenner was. Shooting off his mouth constantly. Head slap to LeVar Ball. Who just cannot keep his mouth shut. With all that said now. Let's turn to the final word from the wood. Now last week I saluted Mr. Robinson. Jackie Robinson. This week I mourned the loss of another Robinson. Frank Robinson. The consummate pro who played for four teams over a brilliant 21-year career passed away Thursday in Los Angeles from bone cancer at the age of 83. Robinson was one of the first black superstars for the Cincinnati Reds in the 1950s, winning Rookie of the Year in 1956. Frank Robinson also won Most Valuable Player for the Reds in 1961 in their pennant winning season. One of the most foolish trades 
that the Cincinnati Reds ever made was trading Frank Robinson, who then general manager Bill DeWitt called an old 30, trading Robinson to the Baltimore Orioles after the 1965 season. Many people said that the 1965 Reds were hitting heavy but pitching light. And they traded one of their best hitters, who was considered old, for pitching. The pitchers that the Reds got didn't pan out. Frank Robinson, rightfully angry, not only won the most valuable player in the American League, the first player to win most valuable player awards in both leagues, and to date the only player to have done so in both leagues. But he also won the Triple Crown. He also won World Series MVP as the Baltimore Orioles rolled to the 1966 World Series title. Frank Robinson also led the Baltimore Orioles to another World Series in 1970, ironically beating the budding Big Red Machine. Robinson was a feared clutch hitter and unquestioned clubhouse leader. Robinson's 586 home runs are still 10th most all time. Robinson played the game tough, hard-nosed, but with grit and class. He fearlessly crowded the plate against pitchers like Juan Marshall, Bob Gibson, and John Drysdale, who would brush him back, knock him down. His 186 hit times hit by uh, pitch was third all time. Robinson was long known as a manager in the Caribbean Winter Leagues in the late 60s and early 70s and openly campaigned for a managerial job. The California Angels traded Robinson to Cleveland in 1974, and he was named player manager in 1975, hitting a home run in his first game and his first at bat. Robinson was not only the first black manager in the majors, he was also the first black manager in the National League when he was named manager of the San Francisco Giants in 1981. Robinson returned to Baltimore to manage a Wobegon Orioles team that started out 0-6 and, and would eventually start out 0-21. Finishing 54-107 and 107 in 1988, he improved the team to 87-75 and 75 in 1989, winning manager of the year and nearly stealing the ALS, AL East title, losing that on the last day of the season. Robinson is one of two players in Major League history, Nolan Ryan being the other, to have their number retired by three different teams. The Orioles, Reds, and Indians have all retired Robbie's number 20. All three of these teams have statues of Robbie in front of their respective ballparks. And Robinson said that he was very bitter to the team that brought him up to the big leagues and then traded him, but finally forgave the Reds after they inducted him into their team's Hall of Fame in 1978 and then retired his number in 1998. Though most baseball folks think of Robinson as an Oriole and his baseball cap in the Hall of Fame has an Orioles logo, Robinson hit more home runs and played longer in Cincinnati. His 304 home runs is second in club history, by fellow Hall of Famer Johnny Bench. I had the honor of a brief interaction with Robinson when he was manager of the Washington Nationals in 2005. Before a day game with the Reds, Robinson was signing autographs by the Nationals dugout and was surprised that so many people knew who he was. I stated to him in the brief interaction I had that I wore the number 20 when I played softball to honor him. And he peered at me and asked me, do you know why I wear 20? I replied that I did that he was honoring Negro Leaguer Josh Gibson. He gave me a nod of affirmation and shook my hand, stating that he was duly impressed with my knowledge of baseball history. And that was one of the firmest handshakes that I ever got. And while I was never big on autographs, I wish they had camera phones at that back in that day. 
that the interaction of a Hall of Famer was something that I treasure. And I mourn the loss of a baseball hero of mine. Frank Robinson passed away at 83. And that is the final word from the wood. With the music coming up in the background, you know that means your time in the Hoodwood is just about done. And I thank you once again for your visit this week. Email for the show is kjgreen at blackbanditproductions.com. You can send me emails on show topics, questions, comments, praise, and criticism. I welcome your correspondence, and I try to reply to every email in a timely manner. You can catch this podcast on a number of sites, including iTunes and Google Play. The show site itself is hoodwoodsports.podbean.com. And I will be trying to uh, get more cool links up on the site. It already has the previous show links. And I will update some of the information up there as quickly as I can. I'm also on Facebook at Black Bandit Productions and Enterprises. I'm on Twitter as well at KJBB20 and KJBB as well as YouTube. So, that's that, fellow sports fans. Until next time out in the Hoodwood, I'm KJ Green. Sports from the Hoodwood is a Black Bandit Productions and Enterprise.